Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm thrilled to bring a conversation that I got to have with one of my favorite authors, Rob Bell. It was really cool to have a conversation with Rob about his new book called How to Be Here. And as you guessed it, it is about being present in the here and now, having awareness, and how to go about gaining that proper perspective on what it is you do during your day and during your days. Some of the things that we got to talk about include routines and rhythms, as well as rituals, and even taking a Sabbath. We also got to talking about career and calling and how all of those things fit together into having that proper perspective as you approach your day, your days, your weeks, your months, you get it. Anyway, it was a really cool conversation. I know that I really enjoyed reading the book as well as listening back to this conversation. Yes, I've even done that once before you're even hearing it. And I got to say, it's one of my favorites. So there you go, unashamedly. Before you get to hear that conversation, I want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. And in fact, as I was listening to this conversation, I found a lot of different ways that FreshBooks can connect to helping you have that full awareness and attention on where you are. Because with FreshBooks, you can track your time you worked on a project and have a pre-designed invoice with your own branding and color scheme ready to go. You can send it off with ease to your client. You can monitor your clients having seen your invoices. They can even pay you online, which reduces the friction there and gets you paid faster. You can send a late payment reminder, which hopefully you don't need, but it's nice to know it's there. You can even use it to get a deposit up front, which is a great way to kick off a project. But FreshBooks isn't just about getting paid. It's also about stress-free organizing and streamlining your expenses. So you don't have to have a box of receipts lying around. In this conversation with Rob, we even touch on how clutter can become an obstacle to getting your work done. And again, that's what FreshBooks is about, is this streamlined way to track having done the work, getting paid for the work, and then streamlining, organizing what you're you're spending your money on after you've gotten paid for the work. And I'm not a numbers person, so having a way to track expenses with a mobile app, especially when it comes time for taxes, is a bonus. FreshBooks is offering listeners of Beyond the To-Do List access for 30 days of unrestricted use to kick the tires, get paid a few times even, have peace of mind tracking and organizing your time, expenses, and getting paid, and you don't even need a credit card for the trial. To claim your free month, head on over to freshbooks.com slash to do and enter to do in the how did you hear about us section. Again, to claim your free month, go over to freshbooks.com slash to do that's T O D O enter T O D O to do in the how did you hear about us section. Thanks again to FreshBooks for sponsoring this episode of beyond the to do list. And now enjoy this conversation with Rob Bell. This week, it's my privilege to welcome Rob Bell to the show. Welcome. Uh, it's great to be with you. Okay, it's working now. We've been having Skype issues, and now they're gone. So inside we have joke prevailed. for just, Yeah, inside joke for Rob and myself, but, you know, and I won't even edit this. But anyway, Rob, I've been following you for years and years, and randomly, uh, I think I saw that you were giving away your, your novel on Instagram, and it said, sign up for the newsletter. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. So I did. And then I got this email, and it was the story – you telling the, a truncated version of the story of your head injury from the summer of 2000. And as I'm reading it, yeah. it, sitting there in the coffee shop, I'm fascinated. And then you expand upon it in the new book. And I just thought, wow, it's almost, it was almost like having a superpower. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have been doing interviews – what are we at? End of June <laughs> since February – and nobody has used the word superpower. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the head injury was you're being bit by the radioactive spider in a way. Oh, oh my, you're piling it on. I love it. <laughs> it oddly did feel, I mean, obviously people who take hallucinogenics and lots of different drug trips, people talk about having access to that which they previously didn't have access to. You know, people talk about peak experiences. Mm-hmm. People talk about, but it did have that sense like, I was tasting something that I had never tasted before. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> Superpower, though. That's well, awesome. Well, and it was, I mean, for me, as you're, as you're describing this, you know, sense of, I mean, what was it? It was water skiing, right? Yeah. And it was just, I mean, you hit the, you hit your head with water too hard, 
which is a really know, weird doing thing flips. to say. Yeah. Flips yeah. on a wakeboard, and I just kept over-rotating, flip after flip after flip, landing on the back of my head. Then I'd get up, and I'd flip again and hit my back of my head. And eventually, I didn't know what day of the week it was, and they, get, they got me in the boat, and I was just out of it. And, it, and as much as that sounds almost like the opening of a Hallmark movie, where then you have to re- you know, connect oh, yeah. with your wife and your kids and all that. Learn and, to cut an apple again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 you describe it as like, yeah, I mean, you do almost describe it as, and I go superpower, but you go like, it's slightly hallucinogenic, yeah. but it's not like you're seeing things that weren't already there. It's just that you almost had this absence of past and future, and you were only right. in the moment. Right. The, the great teacher Ramdas talks about the goal of life is to be fully present in a place where you are connected with the depth of reality without needing any artificial superpowers or stimulants to get you there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That actually practice or spiritual practice, the goal is you would become so present, you would see the depth and beauty and meaning and transcendence of your relationships, your presence on the planet, your work that you have to do, that you would just see it all in its fullness and uh, that's what happened is I, my brain, whatever happened with the concussion, my brain didn't have energy to think about the future. It didn't have any energy to think about the past. And the past is where regret comes from. And worry and anxiety often come from the future. What might happen? All I could do was be in the moment. And the moment was absolutely awesome. You even described something where, where I've done this. So I was like, oh, I, I kind of get that, where you're sitting still and you're, you're watching the sunlight come in like through a window or something and you see the air particles or the dust <laughs> particles, I should say. And you're just like, they're yeah. floating, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, and you think about when people talk about, like your friend is telling you a story about something really meaningful that happened. She'll often say something like, and then we all got quiet. Or, and then there was like, we were all really still because we didn't want to miss it. That when we talk about the moments when we feel most connected with our lives are generally moments when we describe some sort of slowing down, some sort of quiet. Sometimes there's an emptiness, stillness. Uh, and we are, we are just here having this moment and we're not worried about our inbox and we're not worrying about Friday night's plans and we're not concerned that our kid is going to spill that thing over there, which is how most of life is. Your brain is <laughs> in all these different places at the same time. The thing that surprised me was learning that this happened to you way back in the summer of 2000, like 16 years ago. And yeah. yet that was prior to the majority of your being known for any of the stuff that you do these <laughs> days. And so yeah. a lot of what you talk about in the rest of the book prior to the story is you, in a sense, working out, holding on yes. to that superpower as you, you had like a full – okay, I'll go to the drug trip thing. You, you, you had the drug trip in a sense, you know, the epiphany, and then it's like, no, I want to hold on to that. It's fleeting. It's right. going away, and how do, I, how do I get back to that uh, and live life every so, day? Oh, man, I'm just telling you as a writer, you totally get it. You're on it. Exactly. I experienced something, then life went back to normal, which is distracted, stressed, going 100 miles an hour, and it wasn't enough. I was like, I, I want to live like that, mm -hmm. even in the course of everyday life. And I didn't come from a tradition that gave me those tools. I, I knew work hard, success, achievement, try to get a bigger house, try to help more people, um, are more people involved in coming to the thing that we're doing? Great. Then we're succeeding. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have any resources for how to be here and nowhere else. And something about the modern world has split us and distracted us more than ever. So it was the book is in some ways 15 years of what I've learned or muscles you develop or tools that you gain so that you cannot feel like your life is passing you by or you're skimming the surface of your own existence. That's yeah. exactly what it was. Yeah, I, I, and I kept, it kept resonating with me because I kept seeing you were talking about things like rhythm and routines yeah. and the Sabbath, all to get back to that perspective, that proper perspective on being where right. you are. Right, and traditionally, I mean, in lots of cultures throughout human history, you had a ritual which a friend of mine describes as physical poetry, in essence, 
What a ritual does is it reminds you, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing here. This is what we're going to do next. Uh, a ritual grounds you, and it sort of brings you back to the moment. Traditional cultures had a song, a ritual, a rite, a chant, a dance, a song, a prayer, whatever. It had all of these ways to keep you here. But for many people in the modern world, they're cut off from these sorts of practices. So it's just wake up, answer some more emails, go to work, watch some Netflix, go to Target. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you're sitting in an airport waiting to go somewhere and you were somewhere else. And it's just all, you're here, you're there, you're all over the place, but you rarely feel like you're actually tasting the depth of your own life. Uh, so part of it was l- learning this and understanding these factors that are in play. First of all, I love that uh, the, the ritual being physical poetry is, is – I love that. Yeah. Love it. You like, know, Krista Tippett has a new book uh, on wisdom where she does a whole section on that idea of how a ritual is, is essentially physical poetry. But it's, she says it so well and uh, it's very, very helpful for understanding that. Cool. I'll have to check that out. I, I I have heard of her. I had not heard of her new book. Oh, yeah. It's really, really, really powerful. I love that when you talk about this, you break it down and you go from like phase to phase in a sense of at one point you're talking about how to work on unstarted or unfinished work that's right in front of you. There's this this thing where you go and you talk about how you go and you sit down at your your desk and how that is in a sense a ritual where it's the, okay, yes. I've sat down. This is where I work. Yes. I talk about how whatever you is that you do each day, there is a craft dimension to it. There's an art form dimension. To being a mom, there is a craft to being a mom, to being a salesperson, to being a podcaster, to being a principal, uh, to taking out, to collecting trash. I mean, there's an art to all this. And many people in the modern world have lost this, but the physical setting, the tools that you use, the equipment that you use are all part of how you do your work in the world. So one of the things that I've observed is the people that were doing great work and seemed to have some level of enjoyment about their path, when I would interview them or, or go visit them, they often, what they, their physical space was arranged in a particular way. They'd be like, this is my desk. This is the pen. This is the pictures that I look at. And a lot of people, their physical space is filled with all kinds of crap. You know what I mean? There's <laughs> yes. clutter. There's, they'll say like, oh, it's just so messy. It's shocking how your physical environment affects your interior life. And if you have too much stuff, if you have too much clutter, if your car is filled with trash, it actually, there is a deep, I would argue, spiritual connection with your sense of peace, your sense of calm, your sense of intentional, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're doing today. Uh, so I begin with like really basic stuff, like get rid of all the crap at your desk so that it's a clean place. And when you sit down, you're like, this is what I do. And this matters. And this is good for the world. And now I'm going to do my work for another day. These sorts of things can, can radically transform your life. So the, the rituals that you do in terms of what you sit down and, and – well, and, and what you – you're talking about uncluttering so that you can actually do the ritual. Yeah, if it's physical poetry, you have to have room yeah. to write in the lines. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you'll find a lot of people will say, well, like I got a, I got these six different things I've started, but none of them are finished, and they're just sort of all hanging around. Pick two of them, actually finish them, put the four of them in a box in storage. Do the two so that you have the sense of satisfaction that you did those two. Then pull the other ones out. Otherwise, it's just a hairball. It's just a hairball of stuff that you'd like to do that, that gives you all this guilt and shame, but you don't feel like you're actually making progress. And for a lot of people, you just you have to break it down. And part of being present is simply, this is what we're going to do today. And at the end of today, we will have taken a whack at that. Mm-hmm. And there will be a level of satisfaction and joy in that. Uh, that's why we're here. And it's so simple. I feel like I'm talking like 101 but it actually changes everything. Since so much of our work these days is done in a digital space, yeah. you really drive home, especially early on, this blinking line, the cursor blinking at you, <laughs> yes. staring you down. 
Uh, I love that. And th- and I think that's one of the key, I mean, because I've been there. We've all been there. I haven't started. I don't know how to start. I don't know what to do. And one of the things you drive home also is this thought that we, we don't do it because we're, we have this fear of non-originality, we, that somebody's already oh, yeah. done it. One of the things I talk about in the book is getting out of your head. And I've met more people who had something they wanted to do. It was like, it's like at their heartbeat level, I'd always wanted to try this. But, you know, there's all kinds of people who already do that. Yes, but you haven't done it. And they may be saying that, and you may be saying something similar, but that thing hasn't come through you, through your unique challenges, desires, longing, heartache, pain, that this idea that you can only do things that are brand new and original, the world has never seen. The world has never seen you. And you will, at the deepest level, fundamentally be a unique expression of whatever it is. So people are like, well, there's lots of school teachers out there. Yeah, but you, you haven't done that. And when you do it, you will bring your own uniqueness to it. So uh, a lot of the reasons why people are stuck in their lives, it's important to get out of your own head. Who you aren't isn't interesting. Your friend who seems to have more energy and be smarter and have more money, not interesting when it comes to you and your path. That a lot of these head games get in the way of people finding their path. One of the things you talk about is dropping this word just and having <laughs> yeah. something that gets you out of bed in the morning. I love that because I don't really struggle with getting out of the bed in the morning, really. Uh, I like doing that. But at the same time, like I've catch myself saying the word, yeah, I just got to do this or I just got to do that. And that's just so like self-defeating in the like, <laughs> you know, right. uh, like a self-fulfilling prophecy type way. Yeah, it's like you stack the odds against yourself from the beginning. In the book, I talk about... I was so interested the past couple of years, the number of, uh, I'd be doing an event and somebody would raise their hand and they'd say, I got this question. Now I'm just a mom or I'm just an accountant, <laughs> but I was wondering. And, and what was so struck me was the idea that you're just this or just that when the depth and meaning of life comes when you connect with the depths of your the depth is when you aren't just a mom, but you are taking part in something much larger than yourself, that we all, we want to be a part of something larger than ourselves. And when we say, I'm just this or I'm just that, from the beginning, we're cutting ourselves off from the deep connectivity of all of creation. And that a lot of times people have already defeated themselves by the language that they're using. The people I meet who say, well, you know, I'm a terrible parent, but I have this question how are you ever going to find joy in being a parent if your first sentence about being a parent is, I'm a terrible parent? No one has ever raised your kid before. Mm. No one has ever tried to raise this kid. So you're learning how to be a parent to this kid. This is a much better message to be telling yourself than you're a terrible parent. So much of being present is about identifying the destructive voices that are playing in your head and replacing them with more true and beautiful messages. And it definitely goes back to the whole finding the craft of the thing that yeah. it, it is what, you know, finding the craft in whatever you do, whether that's something that you've chosen to do or whether that's an obligation, whether that's, you know, you're sitting in your cubicle and that's the job that you can get right now if times are tough, but you find the craft in that. Yes. And what's often interesting is it's often the most mundane jobs that when somebody does them with a sense of craft is suddenly they leap and you're like every one of us has been in a store and the person helping us was really on it. They like actually were giving it their best and it actually matters. It, it actually changes things. And the idea that human beings have this sort of potential and power is just staggering to me. So I just begin with you throwing yourself into whatever you're doing is is fundamentally interesting and good for the world. That reminds me of a story that just came to me. It's it, John Acuff tells this story. He uh, he was calling up Apple support. Something was broken in his iTunes, and he's talking to this woman who's you know up in her late forties, early fifties, or something. And he says, you know, so how so why are you doing this job? Do you mean is this your you know? I don't know how the conversation got to that point, but basically she expresses, I love talking to people every day, and I get to learn so much about how to like figure stuff out and troubleshoot. Oh, so good. And it's a call center person. 
and it just it it flips it on its head, and suddenly you're like, even a call center person, and, and see, even me saying even right there was kind of a just just a call center person. Yeah. Right, right, and it's these these roles that people sort of pass over, like, well, I'm made, made for much bigger stuff. You go do that, and you throw yourself into it, and doors will open. That is how the world works. Well, and, and the other thing is, is that if you're thinking that you're made for bigger stuff, then in a sense, because you're aiming only for that, and you miss the craft of learning all the yeah. different crafts along the way, then when you get up to that place, you're kind of going to be a little bit hollow in some senses. Right, right, right. Well said. Very well said. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> and, and I think the other thing is, is that, uh, and, and I haven't even touched on this word. I've got it written down here. I'm trying to figure out how you pronounce it. Is it ikigai? Ikigai? Ikigai. And so the Japanese word ikigai is this finding this joy in, in, in everything you do, but that's a simplifi- oversimplification of what that means. Um, yeah, the, the Japanese have this word that sort of means that which gets you out of bed in the morning. Sometimes it's translated reason for being. Mm-hmm. That uh, you're a key guy is what gets you out of bed in the morning. It's your sense that you have a, you have a meaningful contribution to make. And, and what I find really interesting is your key guy may shift over the course of your days. For some people, it's like you go to college, you get trained, you get to do something, and you do that for the rest of your life. But I don't know anybody who's done the exact same thing the whole time. And maybe if people loosened their attachment to doing this thing every day for the rest of my life and thought of it as a bit more fluid. Like you're doing this now and then that season may end and you may do something else. Somebody near you may become very sick and you need to take care of them. The economy may shift and the thing that you're doing may be not needed anymore. So you go do something else. If the whole thing is thought of in much more fluid and adventurous terms, your life is an adventure that you get to go on. So what are you going to do for this season? And then what are you going to do in the next season? It's just a much, much better way to think about the whole thing. And the Japanese, of course, the assumption is that your ikigai will take a lot of work. You, it, will, uh, it will be a never-ending process that you are working through. Um, because I meet more people who are like, I want to get this figured out so that I can relax and co- sort of cruise. But that's not actually how life works. And it's kind of this struggle between there's nothing else harder than doing that or easier yes. than doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's both exhausting and exhilarating all at the same time. <laughs> and, th- and that whole idea of like, okay, I'm going to pick this thing and it's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Like the fallacy of I'm going to pick my college major. That's what I'm going to, this is my career for the rest of my life. Right, right, right. So podcasting, you're doing this now and I'm doing this now, but podcasting didn't exist when neither of us were in college. I know. So that was not an option. (laughs) Right. And, and overnight it feels like this medium appeared that you can sit at your desk and talk to people all over the world for free. I mean, that is, if we had described this to us 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would have been like, what? That is amazing. A hundred dollar microphone? You can do that? Incredible. Yeah. And I think that just, just moving forward again, if we're going to be shifting from thing to thing to thing, because circumstances change and we grow and we change, then again, that's just another reason to look back and or look at every time you're in a, a circumstance right now, or even an opportunity is a better way to maybe spin it, is looking at it from that craft angle. And, and you even go into talking about craft versus success and how yeah. we, we really have this idea of, oh, this is the thing I want to be really, really good at. But going at it for the angle of being good at to be good at it versus being good at it to get paid to do it. And I don't think success and craft are like mutually exclusive, but it depends on your right. definition of success, right? I try to make success sort of this over-inflated, overgrown, bloated thing that's just basically the problem with – I use like capital S in the book mm-hmm. – is when you tell yourself, I will have joy when – I get that money when I have that level of success, when the company is that big, when I accomplish those things. And the problem is what ends up happening is the joy is always just up ahead in the road when I get this. And oftentimes what happens is there is this existential thud when you get the thing that you have been working for the whole time and it doesn't deliver what it was supposed to. 
And what I kept observing over the years is the people that I most admired when I would ask them about their work What they would talk about is the sense of craft, this humbling sense that they were just taking another shot at it, another day to do this work. And that the joy was actually in the gift of getting to do the work. It was in the opportunity to even do this. That success has this, what more can I get? And craft has this, can you believe I get to do this? Yeah, I love it. There's a group of people out there entrepreneurs where they want to sink all their time and effort into creating a something and then hoping to make their mark on the world in a sense. They're the kind of adventurous people that, and and some listen to this show, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) All your listeners. Everyone is. You had something where you already had, like, everything was steady. You're doing things normally. You're, you know, going about your job and, and, well, jobs. uh, And you, in the meantime, you're doing this thing. (laughs) You're creating this thing with Dickie. Uh, with Dickie Lips. Uh, <laughs> and it's not like you went out and, and, you know, I won't tell the story what that is, but it's, you know, basically a side project where you're making a cartoon from stories you were talking <laughs> to your kids about. And yeah, there's it's always not, a side project. Yes. And, <laughs> and the thing is, is that it's not like you put the pressure on that. Like you didn't mortgage your home in order to <laughs> make Dickie Lives work, you know? Uh, I didn't, although I have lost insane amounts of money trying things that no one's ever heard about. <laughs> so, so where's the balance there with that then? Where's the balance of the finding the joy that your Akagi gives you with the, uh, the idea of doing that thing for a living? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, sometimes people have this love of something and their first thought is, if I could just do that for my job, that would be the ultimate. But the problem is, That thing that you love, if you did it for your job, that thing may not be able to bear paycheck kind of weight. You may actually hate that thing if you had to do it. If you had to play golf and win, it might suddenly not be as fun. It might actually be a job. So I always, when talking about a key guy, calling, vocation, path, job, career, etc., I think it's always important to remember Sometimes you just need a job, just a crap job, but that it makes money to put food on the table so you can do the other thing, and the other thing then can be free. It doesn't have any weight. For example, a lot of people would love to be paid to create things, but if you're paid to create things and you have to deliver something, but the muse hasn't visited you, you know what I mean? Yes. (laughs) Like you don't actually have an idea and you have to come up with something that is unbelievably excruciating. I know more people who got a book contract and didn't have anything to say and had to give the money back because they were like, oh, this is different than I thought it would be. If you get paid for that, you actually have to produce something. It's no longer fun. So it's really important to remember sometimes the reason why you love it is because there's nothing at stake. You know what I mean? There's just nothing on the line. You're just making it. So there's lots of things I've made where there was nothing at stake. And lots of things that no one ever knows about because I made it. And then I was like, ah, that's, I don't know what that is. And it's just sitting. I have stuff sitting in my, I have whole books sitting in my computer. <laughs> I, have st- I have so many things I've made that are like, ah, I don't know what that is. That, actually, that novel that I released last fall sat in my computer for five years. It just sat there. So I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And then eventually I was like, why not? I should just give it away for free. <laughs> What I'm getting so at as far here is, as balance, yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea where the balance is other than uh, it, there may, there there are may not be a balance, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know if balance is the question. The question is you have some basic bills that need to be paid, so let's, uh, let's start there because if those aren't taken care of, the amount of stress that you'll be living with, you know what I mean? It's it, not it, worth it. It turns that cursor, that blinking line, into yeah. an even more stressful Right, situation. right, right. Panic. So sometimes I actually think calling is overrated and curiosity is underrated. So, so what are you curious about? What's the thing that you think, I'd like to try that? I'd like to see what that is. And uh, what space do you have in your life to pursue that curiosity? And sometimes you have more than others. I have three kids that are still at home. So I have some work I can do, but then I have a response. I'm here. I'm home. Yeah. I'm not out much. I, if I travel somewhere, I fly there, do my thing, and fly home. 
because tonight's dinner. We're watching basketball. We're going swimming. We're walking the dog. We're doing homework. You know what I mean? Like I got some stuff I got to do. So part of it is how do, and then how much space do you have in your life where you can pursue that? And it may turn into more. It may not, but you'll be alive. You'll be trying something. And that's sometimes just one little thing that you're working on is all it takes to feel more alive. That's awesome. Uh, Kind of in a winding down here, ironically so, let's talk a little bit about how integrating the Sabbath into you can also help you gain back or gain for the first time some of that much-needed perspective. Yes. Sabbath is an ancient practice rooted in a belief that the universe lives according to rhythm. So you have day and night, inhale, exhale. Your body has sympathetic, parasympathetic. Cells are dying. New cells are being born, 300 million every hour. Uh, You have winter, spring, summer, fall. Everything is at some level a sine wave, S-I-N-E, like from math class, up, down, up. There is a rhythm built in to creation. And if you go every day, all day, never off, phone always on, always working, always going, always answering emails, always answering texts and never take a break, you are violating the fundamental rhythms of creation. And so uh, for thousands of years, people have understood that a rhythm of work and rest and play, sleep, and then being awake, like these rhythms if you violate them, you always pay. I, you wouldn't believe the number of people I've talked to who have great despair. Like, what's the point? I'm burned out. Uh, I just find myself sort of gliding through a day, not really into it, depressed. You wouldn't believe how many people I will just ask them, what day a week are you not working where you just do things that feed your soul? You wouldn't believe how often people will say, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Jeez. But every day is just like all the other days. And despair is the spiritual disease of believing that tomorrow will simply be a repeat of today. Despair is when you look into the future and all you see is an endless repeat of this. And so often what we need to be liberated from is despair. And that's what happens when all of a sudden you realize tomorrow could be different. And one of the ways that you practice this, and for many people who would just say, I'm cynical, I'm pessimistic, I don't have hope, I'm I'm kind of bummed about everything, take a day a week and treat it different than all the other days. Turn off your cell phone. Ask the question, what feeds your soul? Go do that. I mean, there's obviously thousands of years of witness to this. It's shocking how much it can transform your life. It's just unbelievable. So that's where in the book I talk about Sabbath is just living with rhythm. For me, as soon as I started practicing one day different than the others, I began to get so much more done in so much less time. It it was revolutionary for me. I love even how you take what you found in that one day off and you take it back into the week where you've got like a rhythm of the day where, for example, I know you, you say you've got in the morning you're creating, in the afternoon you're doing admin type work. And in the evening, done. No more work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, other than occasional something here or there. Yeah. The the rhythm of a day, it can change everything. It can really, I can't recommend it enough. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Rob, it's been so awesome talking with you. We could go for another hour, but we're not going to. You'll have to, (laughs) you're going to have to come back on the show and we'll, we'll go deeper into all these and other topics. So, Great talking to you. The book is How to Be Here by Rob Bell. And where can people find that? And I want them to go listen to your show, by the way. So where can we find that as well? Uh, Robcast is on iTunes, the Robcast. And then at robbell.com. I'm on tour now the rest of the year. So I'm all over the place. I'm probably coming to your city at some point. So all that's at robbell.com. And then I do shows at a comedy club here in Largo and L.A., And then they can get the book, past books, tour films, everything, uh, past episodes of my podcast is all at robbell.com. Awesome. Rob, thank you so much for being here with me now. (laughs) It's a pleasure and great questions. Really great questions. I enjoyed it. I really hope that you maybe even hit pause here 
or you know, finish listening to what I'm saying first, but then hit pause or hit rewind. Go back to the beginning of this episode now that you've heard the entire episode in its full context and go back and listen again because I know that I did for real because I'm not just a podcaster. I use podcasting as a learning mechanism myself and I really enjoyed this conversation. I am going to start to implement some of the things that I talked to Rob about, such as having daily rhythms and routines, and especially practicing these things like a Sabbath that will continue to shape and reshape my perspective moving forward on how I spend my time and how I look at the work that I do and how I go about doing it. And I hope you do the same. I hope that you take the time to pause and reflect and think deeply on this subject about being where you are, being here now. I want to say thank you to FreshBooks for supporting this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Again, you can go grab that quick and easy way to stress-free, get paid, track your time, organize your expenses, and much more all in one at freshbooks.com slash to-do and enter to-do in the how did you hear about us section. Thanks again to Fresh Books for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Thanks again for listening. I hope you got something awesome out of this episode. Let me know. You can hit me up on twitter.com slash Eric with a K, the letter J, F-I-S-H-E-R, or go to the show notes for this episode, which you can find at beyondthetodolist.com slash 139. Thanks again. I will see you next episode. Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.